Good evening and thank you for joining me. This is Eric J. Tonight we'll be discussing Federalist Paper Number 7. Don't forget, make sure you remember to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out whenever I upload a new video. Also, for those fans of Ron Paul, go ahead and look below in the description box for a link to his homeschool curriculum. Once again, thank you for joining me. Federalist Paper Number 7 is once again by the Founding Father Alexander Hamilton discussing or rather addressing the Independent Journal which is specifically addressing the people of New York as their readership. In this one, this is actually going further into the concept of dissension of the states. Rather, what kind of conflicts would be arising should the states ever disunite and become their own nations effectively or uh, gather together as small confederacies along the similar lines of the previous papers. Now the initial question that Hamilton asks is what would prompt the states to make war with one another should they become disunited? During this analysis, Hamilton goes into actually multiple options which obviously would be going through here. These multiple options have historically led it to very bloody wars in between nations within the world itself as they currently exist with, within Hamilton's time and Hamilton draws correlations between how the nations currently respond to one another via these options and how the states, should they become independent nations, would most likely respond in kind. The first option being that of more material concerns, specifically that of territory. He concedes that even at this current moment, while under the restrictions placed upon them by the current federal constitution at the time, which was the Articles of Confederation, the nation has had enough experience with issues related to territory to understand how this would cause schisms and hostilities to erupt in between the nation, uh, in between the states, which would in effect become their own independent nations. As a direct relation to this, Hamilton draws the parallel to how other nations have handled territorial disputes. And we're going to go into essentially the vast tracts of nation, the vast tracts of territories that existed at the time for the United States as they currently existed. And the parallels that whenever a new territory was found or there was a mutual discovery between different nations at the time, Different, uh, different European nations that it caused a great deal of conflict and, and schisms. Related to all of this are the unsettled claims that were currently being addressed or that would have been addressed by the various states themselves should these claims be brought back into the public forum. And new claims would most likely materialize. Pursuant to this, Hamilton points out that there have historically been these claims between the various between the various states that the current constitution have effectively suppressed and we'll get into how and that the well, once these restrictions of these territorial claims had been rescinded then most likely Hamilton realizes that the that new states that new claims would be arising from the various states that would now be uh, existing that didn't previously exist before as our own sovereign nations. Hamilton points out that there have been some rather serious and animated discussions in between the states related to these territorial claims. Animated discussions regarding the rights related to these claims which went ungranted due to the fact that these, these territories were claimed by the British Crown at the time. Of course, these same claims by the Crown went away when the Union was, when the Union was formed and the, when the Peace Treaty was formalized. Especially those parts of the vast Western territories, as well as those lands which were owned by the Indian territories but which were submitted to the British Crown. Until such claims of ownership were done away with through the Peace Treaty and ceded to the Confederacy at the time. In order to quell the disputes that would inevitably arise, they were, there was agreements between the states and Congress to cede those claims to Congress 
so that it would severely reduce or eliminate a lot of unnecessary contentions. However, Hamilton also notes that should the Confederation, should the Congress be dissolved and the states form confederacies or the states go their own way, then inevitably these territorial disputes would simply erupt once again and hostilities would inevitably be initiated as a result of these competing claims. And these states would simply expect that their claims would be honored, the claims on these territories would be honored through a process of reversion, assuming that once a grant, in this case of land, is made, it cannot be unmade. And he also realizes that once these states basically became their own nations and they had all of these claims, well obviously it was assumed also by Hamilton that once the domination by the crown was ended and the and all of these vast tracts of land were now opened up, those claims that were then beholden to the that were then ceded to Congress would then uh, erupt into claims even by new claims by the states which they would desire in proportion to their own representation meaning they have more people so they should have a greater claim to greater tracts of land and as anybody who has land know land means money because land means resources the more access to more land you have the more the higher probability you have to access greater amounts of resources and resources equal wealth Hamilton notes and quoting their argument would be that a grant once made could not be revoked, that the justice in par of participating in territory acquired or secured by the joint efforts of the Confederacy remain undiminished. Referencing what it was stating before. Even if conceding the mutual rights of all of those, of all the states to this vast tract of lands, meaning the Western territories, the concern for Congress then changes to a brand new obstacle, which becomes that of, of apportionment, or how to divvy up this land. If each state says, well, we want it to be done this way, and another, then another would state would say, well, no, we want it to be done this way, they would all want it to be done in a way that favors their own methodology and obviously favors them in that, in turn. Regardless of how it might affect opposing interests, basically, regardless of how it might affect each of their uh, neighboring states which might not lend well to a uh, peaceful transition. Given just the sheer amount of this vast tract of land in the Western territories, Hamilton observed that it would lend to a great deal of general hostilities without any kind of common judge to arbitrate these. And considering history and how nations had previously uh, addressed these kinds of concerns, they would be more likely to revert to the sword or military force to resolve the conflict instead of mutual agreement. Looking back into their current history, Hamilton looks back into a situation between Connecticut and Pennsylvania and a similar disagreement in that situation, respecting the land at Wyoming. Now, according to the Articles of Confederation at the time, they required that such disputes be submitted up to a federal court for decision. Now, the court at the time found in favor of Pennsylvania, but Connecticut obviously, uh, the Connecticut had some issues with how this went because then they were put in an unfavorable position, which was eventually rectified through a mixture of management and negotiation. Hamilton also references a similar dispute between New York and Vermont, where a level of opposition arose which had the confederacy dissolved might have eventually led to a, a conclusion by force of arms from New York. This general opposition took two forms, one of which was the jealousy about the future power and influence of New York and the second reason was the interest of certain influential individuals from other states and their own claims of land within New York itself. To quote Hamilton, even the states which brought forward claims in contradiction to ours seemed more solicitous to dismember the state than to establish their own pretensions. These were New Hampshire, these were New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. 
New Jersey and Rhode Island, upon all occasions, discovered a warm zeal for the independence of Vermont and Maryland, till, till alarmed by the appearance of a connection between Canada and that state, meaning Vermont, entered deeply into the same views. These being small states, saw with an unfriendly eye the perspective of our, meaning New York, growing greatness. Now, considering these issues, Hamilton considers it likely to trace from them causes which would lead to inevitable causes of conflict between the relevant states should they become disunited. Now, the next option that Hamilton addresses is that of commerce. Hamilton observed that competition through commerce has always led to contentious relationships. Those states in less favorable circumstances would be more inclined to share in the more advantageous situations of their more prosperous neighbors. To quote Hamilton, each state or separate confederacy would issue a system of commercial policy peculiar to itself. This would occasion distinctions, preferences, and exclusions which would beget discontent. The habits of intercourse on the basis of equal privileges to which we have been accustomed since the earliest settlements of the country would give a keener edge to those causes of discontent than they would naturally have independent of this circumstance. Hamilton also notes that the spirit of enterprise, meaning the commercial aspect of this nation, was always prone to self-innovate. Considering this, should each state disunite from one another, the more commercially beneficial states would find it within their best advantage to begin to form their own internal regulations as to how commerce between themselves and their neighboring states would, would play out. They would form regulations which would provide exclusive benefit to their own citizenry. Infractions against these regulations or attempts to repel them as such, Hamilton notes, would naturally lead to outrages, reprisals, and even war. The opportunities inherent of some states would also have the inevitable effect of rendering them as tributary, meaning providing support to or even paying out a, a tribute amount and affect the tariff to those who to those states which are in a better commercial situation. Considering the relative situation of New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, it affords a very reasonable example of this. New York must lay or place duties upon their imports by reason of generating revenue. A great part of these duties are paid by the very citizens of the other states relating to the purchases that they make. So in other words, these states import goods from New York and pay additional money on that, on those goods relating to the duties that New York charges these other states for uh, to import out uh, as they export out these goods and Connecticut and New Jersey imports them into, the, into their own nations at the time. Hamilton recognized that New York would be both unwilling and unable to forgo this commercial advantage. He also observed that New York's own citizens would be unwilling to pay those duties levied against these goods as opposed to simply passing the cost on to their neighbors and quite honestly why not if people are going to be importing in these goods they should also pay for the cost related to that instead of simply levying a higher tax on your own native citizenry what's the point it would be impractical as far as distinguishing the gus the customers in her markets considering this Hamilton also pauses a question rel related to the situation Quote, would Connecticut and New Jersey long submit to be taxed by New York for her exclusive benefits? Should we, long should we be long permitted to remain in this quiet and undisturbed enjoyment of a metropolis from the possession of which we derived so, so from which we derived an advantageous, sorry, an advantage so odious to our neighbors, in their opinion so oppressive? Should we be able to preserve it against the incumbent weight of Connecticut on the other side and the cooperating pressure of New Jersey on the other? To be bold, the answer would be an affirmative. Now, a point of consideration for contemporary times, for you and me. We can uh, consider this since, at this point, Hamilton is addressing this as a what-if situation between competing nations. 
where New York is its own nation, New Jersey and Connecticut would be their own nations, and we take a look, we can draw correlations between this and say our relationship between the United States and say China, European Union, and whatever other nations that our administration is contemplating placing higher and higher tariffs on. Now, should these tariffs continue to grow and get higher, it could conceivably, conceivably ultimately result in force of arms or some level of warfare as these other nations simply are, would be unwilling to absorb these additional financial costs. I mean, it's only been by God's grace that we've been not undergoing a wartime footing because these nations uh, haven't been pushed far enough toward seeing the, the need to military defend their commercial needs, their commercial interests. If you wish to know more about this topic, please ensure to look below at the description box for a link to the Book of the Federalist Papers, which is provided by the Institute for Principal Studies, which is an amazing organization which provides resources relating to economics and the role of government from a biblical perspective. Now, the next point to be addressed that Hamilton references is that of public debt. Hamilton considers the effect that public debt would have on the relationship between the states, sparking hostility should they dissolve the National Union. The first consideration is how would this debt be apportioned amongst the states? The second concern, point of hostility between the states, is how would the progressive pay down of this debt actually be addressed by each respective state? Hamilton also addresses regarding to this progressive pay down the inevitable production of hostilities related to that pay down. People just don't want to have to pay down debt that they don't, they, they, that they did not directly incur. It makes people rather grumpy. Hamilton considers the point of how to possibly ensure agreement with, between the states by enabling effective apportionment of the discharge of this debt. How, Hamilton acknowledged that there are few, if any, such rules that exist at the point when he's discussing this that can be, uh, that can be agreed upon as far as discharging the debts and that these rules are usually rarely ever free from objection. These objections also being exaggerated by the respective parties. It is also pointed out that there are various views among the states themselves about the general rule of paying off this debt. Some not holding it important at all to pay off the debt, largely due to the fact that their respective populations didn't incur any of it, so it's not a portion to them anyways. So for them, why should they pay off what they didn't, what they didn't incur themselves? And they show indifference, if not downright repugnance, at the concept of having to pay off this public debt. Whereas citizens of other states may sometimes hold a gross apportionment, meaning hold far more than would be respective of their population size, they would be strained to find an, an equitable way to repay this, since obviously they hold more debt than they are capable of paying off by themselves. And this obviously creates hostility between them and other states who don't want to pay it off at all because these debts have been incurred basically as a nation. And if these states should subdivide, all of a sudden the state which couldn't pay down the debt and this, and this state which does not want to have to pay it down at all, there's creates that schism of, okay, well, how do we deal with this debt? Hamilton generally observes, and is quoting, the procrastinations of the former would excite the resentments of the latter, reinforcing what I just said. In the end, the equitable rule about how to repay this debt would be delayed. The citizens of the affected states would complain, and those four nations who loaned the money to begin with would naturally demand repayment of the loan. Ultimately, the states would be under the issue of two separate contentions, one which would be a double conflict, one of which would be external invasion, the other one would be internal division. Should all of these obstacles be overcome, it is acknowledged by Hamilton that some states would find it more difficult to bear this burden than others. Those suffering the burden of this debt would seek to lessen it, and still others would not be inclined at all to seek the revision of this payment plan, which is likely to increase their own encumbrances or likely to increase their own part of the burden. This refusal to change would likely influence the complaining states to withhold their own money, a situation not very enthusiastically sought out. The mutual non-compliance of the affected states would most likely lead to arguments and fighting, 
which is essentially hostility and even potentially warfare, depending on how far the disagreements were exacerbated. Additionally, even if all were able to equitably agree upon the principles, there is also the possible inadequacy or inability to pay based on current levels of supply, meaning not being able to contribute due to the inadequate resources to be able to handle their allotments to pay off their, uh, their due apportionment. It's also mismanagement of finances, possible unforeseen accidents, additionally a great deal of reluctance on the part of men for, to part from their money, to part with their money for needs that don't even exist anymore. If we're talking long-term payouts for a, debt that, uh, for a debt on something that is long since gone, which if you consider nowadays how long have we been paying off our debts and passing off our debts onto how many generations in the long run, how many of our grandfather, of our grandchildren, of our great grandchildren, so many generations down the line simply because we want what we want now and we don't care about paying it off because we're, we've lost that level of shame as a society with the prospect of paying off our own national debt that we have incurred ourselves. And reinforcing what I'm saying, well, Hamilton also addresses this by pointing out the interference of monetary needs related to immediate desires. We want stuff now and we want to be able to pay for it but we don't want to have to repay for it. Hamilton also observes that delinquencies and repayments would generally produce complaints, recriminations, and then quarrels. He also points out a general principle that such debts would cause schisms between nations to remit payment for something that doesn't directly provide an immediate benefit. Toward this end, Hamilton notes, quoting, for it is an observation as true as it is trite that there is nothing that men differ so readily about as the payment of money. Finally, Hamilton addressed uh, another part of dissension between the states as far as inf uh, legal infractions against private contracts, basically bad laws. He points out that some legislatures might be more inclined if they are removed from the restrictions of a federal, of a federal government, of a federal constitution, they'd be less inclined to maintain the liberty of their own states by making laws which provide infractions against private contracts, against individual liberty, which inevitably would result in aggressions amongst their own citizens. So these laws becoming a source of great hostility. He points out that there is no reason to even consider that a state legislature, unrestrained by a federal constitution, would would be more tending to more liberal or freedom-based legislation, since Hamilton and his contemporaries have already seen attempted infractions against the laws of liberty by the domestic codes of the relative states. Quote Hamilton, We have observed the disposition to retaliation excited in Connecticut in consequences of the enormities per, uh, per, perpetrated by the legislature of Rhode Island, and we can reasonably infer that in some cases, in similar cases, under other circumstances, a war, not a parchment, but of the sword, which chastised such atrocities, sorry, which chastised such atrocious breaches of moral obligation and social justice. Hamilton also notes the improbability uh, the improbability of incompatible alliances between disparate states or confederacies and foreign nations and how these alliances would affect the peace on our own continent. Referencing back to previous Federalist Papers and the interference by foreign nations in our own domestic politics. His ultimate conclusion is, as a restatement of previously is that should America become disunited it would become a target of these European politics which would in turn continue to fracture us out as a nation for the sake of their own benefit. Have a good evening. Below is a link to the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom where you can learn more about free market economics which is espoused by such amazing scholars as Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you remember to like the video, subscribe, and comment.